Well, hello everyone. It's good to see you uh, and uh, hopefully you can see me all right. I would love to have been outside this afternoon. The sun is shining, but it's too windy, so you wouldn't have been able to hear me. But welcome to this uh, first of the reflections that I'm going to bring to you on the basis of, of the reading. Um, and this is um, by way really of encouraging you and hopefully uh, giving you a, a sense of appetite for the readings and for the discussion that can possibly come from these readings. <clears throat> Pardon me. Really, uh, what I'm asking you to do uh, in interaction with me now is, is to prepare yourself for these, these readings. You may have already started and that's great. Um, but, uh, and, and you may want to read the readings and then come back to this video and reflect on it as well. And I'll put the, the, the text of what I'm saying for you up on, on ARC as well. So here are a number of opportunities to stimulate that conversational spirit uh, in relation to the readings that we'll be sharing together in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> so spiritual care and ageing, I've got my glasses uh, to put on, which is an indication that my eyes are, are certainly changing and, and uh, ageing, something that I'm feeling very much these days. By the way, I should say, I've got my coffee here. Uh, if you feel like you need some kind of uh, beverage or something to help you uh, get into the, the, the study mode, uh, then pause here and go and grab yourself a coffee or a tea or a block of chocolate, whatever it is that you do. Spiritual care and ageing. The readings uh, in this particular section of the course are really designed to open up the questions about what is spirituality, what is spiritual care, and particularly in the contexts of ageing, uh, aged care and palliative care. Our first task, I think, is to really stimulate our thoughts about spirituality, spiritual care, and why these uh, questions are particularly pertinent and have a pertinent role to play in response to the human experience of ageing. We do not have the time to engage in an extensive discussion about definitions of spirituality, so let's just point in the direction of that discussion by identifying one definition that's been increasingly used and discussed in the, in the world of spiritual care over the last few years. <clears throat> this definition was the product of a well-regarded conference on spirituality in healthcare in 2014 that took place in Canada and was convened and led by the outstanding physician and advocate for spiritual care, Christina Pachalski. I'll uh, have a sip of coffee and read this definition for you. It goes like this. Spirituality is a dynamic and intrinsic aspect of humanity through which persons seek ultimate meaning, purpose and transcendence and experience relationship to self, family, others, community, society, nature, and the significant or sacred. Spirituality is expressed through beliefs, values, traditions, and practices. Quite a hefty definition. Please don't worry if, you, if your head's already starting to spin. You've got time. You can go back and you can read these things. And the Pachelski article is there in your readings. You can look at the context of the discussion. You can let it percolate. I love that word percolate, not only because it's related to coffee, but it kind of gives us that idea that, you know, when we first hear something, uh, it, may, it may seem strange and foreign and unclear to us. But as we sit with it, as we think through it, as we allow it to permeate our consciousness, it begins to settle and the ideas contained within it start to open up and become understandable to us. So give yourself time. Perhaps the first thing we notice about this definition is that it doesn't specifically mention religion. The reason for this is not to exclude religion or to diminish its importance at all, but to create a definition within which religion is intrinsically present, but not exclusively so. So the authors of this definition 
wanted to make sure they honoured religion, but also wanted to make sure that we understand that spirituality is something that is intrinsic to human life, regardless of religion or otherwise. The Pachowski definition, as it has come to be known, recognises that spirituality is a universal human trait, rooted in the desire for meaning and relationship in every aspect of our living. <clears throat> you'll be able to recognise that religion is included as a belief, a tradition, and a practice that emerges from the intrinsically human desire for meaning and relationship. In this sense, religion is one of the many languages of our spirit. It is really very important for our understanding of spirituality and spiritual care that we do not confuse spiritual health with the absence of suffering. In fact, the deep listening of the spiritual care practitioner may well confront the patient or client with their own suffering in such a way that makes it feel more intense and present than before. Spiritual care listens for meaning, as the Pachowski definition says, but listens for it in every circumstance. It does not assume that meaning can only be attained when suffering has been overcome. It seeks to build common humanity and mutual relationship as the basis upon which even human suffering, when it is unavoidable, is found to have meaning, purpose, and to be a solid basis upon which relationships are deepened and expanded. So spirit, spirituality, are not contingent on the absence of suffering. They are part of who we are, no matter what the circumstances are. And it follows that to care for someone spiritually does not mean trying to help, the, help them end their suffering in order to find meaning. Of course, uh, if suffering is avoidable, we help to avoid it. The experience and reflection of Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl, particularly in this book called Man's Search for Meaning, which will, will forgive him his gender-exclusive language because of uh, the, uh, the historical time in which he was writing. Uh, but this book, Man's Search for Meaning, explores the nature of meaning and spirituality in the midst of intense suffering. Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor and he invites us in this wonderful little book to what he calls the personal decision to embrace the task of making suffering meaningful or of finding meaning in the midst of our suffering he's careful not to fall into the trap of saying that all suffering is meaningful if suffering can be removed or alleviated the meaningful thing to do would be to remove it or alleviate it. And part of spiritual care, of course, is to advocate for social justice. For spiritual meaning is found in justice, as in any other circumstance of the human life. But holding that fact, that where suffering is avoidable, we should contribute to its removal. Unavoidable suffering is part is a large part is in large part a fundamental aspect of human existence most human persons have an intrinsic sense that it need or should not be merely arbitrary but can actually contribute to our human development and relationship that it can have meaning if we are able to take the time to listen deeply to ourselves, our values, our beliefs, and our deepest desires. So meaning, the search for meaning, whatever the human circumstance. And it follows from all of this that the spiritual care practitioner, the pastor, the chaplain, the deep listener, the spiritual care provider in a public hospital or in a prison, uh, or the counsellor, who brings that element of spiritual care to what they do, it follows that they are not 
in pursuit of a therapeutic resolution necessarily to the suffering of the person with whom they are in that caring relationship. What does follow is that they are seeking to listen in such a way that the person's own spiritual resources in their circumstances are discovered and embraced and realised to enable that person to understand what it means to be fully human and to live fully in those circumstances. And part of that, as the Pachelski definition outlines, is the pursuit of relationship in its, its many forms. Relationship, as we know, as we've all experienced, uh, either through uh, active engaged relationship or through the loneliness uh, of the loss or disengagement from relationship or simply the absence of relationship. Each of us has a sense of its meaning for us as human beings. Even those of us who value our individualism uh, generally acknowledge that we are individuals, and we love that about ourselves, but we are individuals in relationship to other individuals and in relation to our environment. We are, in a limited way, free to act upon and change our environment, to change our relationships with each other. Yet, this freedom to act and to change what is around us is intent, well, something that Paul Tillich calls finite freedom. It's a limited freedom. It's the reality that we are in fact, it's finite because we are in fact determined by our relationships to each other and to the world around us. And perhaps the most basic determinant of the meaning of my living is that uh, I was born and I had no say in that. And so I live in this world and face the questions of living and dying and that is something that I did not choose for myself. So my freedom in that sense is finite. I also know that I will die and that is something that I did not choose. That is something that determines something about me. So my freedom is finite. <clears throat> Raymond Gator's story that you'll read or may have already read in your readings reveals the deep connection between relationship, meaning and what he calls common humanity. In his story, it is the lack of condescension in the woman caring for the patients that reveals their full humanity, the patient's full humanity, to the other staff around her. Her sober love for them establishes their humanity in a social sense. The ha it, this is amazing, I love this. The behaviour of another person can be revelatory for us. For example, the resident of an aged care facility might unwittingly be seen and understood by staff as synonymous with his condition, his behaviour. And so we might hear words such as, oh, Marty won't be interested. He has dementia. Yet when another human being demonstrates uncondescending love towards Marty, staff may begin to see him not as dementia, but as a full and valuable human person. Gator uses the quite striking example uh, in prisons, where in some prisons, the prison guards are not allowed to to uh, or different staff are used in the area where prisoners meet their families because the prison guards that work with them day by day within the prison uh, are discouraged from seeing the prisoners in light of their family relationships in in and through the eyes of those who love them for who they are regardless of what their behavior has meant for them and society and so the true and real humanity of the prisoners uh, is revealed to the prison guards or would be revealed to the prison guards and so they're prevented from seeing them in that environment. So you can get that sense that where there is real and uncon an uncondescending mutual love, something of, of the mystery of our humanity is revealed to all of us. In this, we can see the opportunity for understanding the true nature of spiritual care. 
One of the ways we can care for each other in a spiritual sense is to relate to one another in ways <clears throat> that establish mutual humanity and dignity. As we do so, those around the person we are caring for will see, perhaps for the first time, their full humanity. This is not a question of a therapeutic remedy. It is a question of establishing an environment within which meaning can be discovered through relationship. One of the key approaches to spiritual care for people who are advancing in their ageing is to invite them to, to discover meaning in their stories. <clears throat> Andrew Lester, in his fantastic little book, got it, got it here, there it is, I, I, I realise that's back the front for you, um, called Hope in Pastoral Care and Counselling, published in 1994, highlights that a sense of time Past, present and future is integral to the experience of hope. As we age, time and the changes it presents to us becomes very much in focus. Lester writes about the impact that our senses of the future, our sense of the future, has on our sense of meaning in life. When we can project our imaginations into the future and tell ourselves a story about how it will unfold, we have what he calls a future story to invest ourselves in. However, the dynamics of narrative and time are, as we know, unpredictable and unstable, to say the least. As time passes, our circumstances change, and with those changes comes change in the possible future stories that we can imagine for ourselves. We can experience this as loss although sometimes it's experienced as opportunity opening up, but as loss, particularly when relationship, health, cognitive ability and social standing are compromised in some way, things that are common as we increase in age. For those of us who find that our future story has changed so considerably that we cannot find hope in it, Lester asserts that the story of our past becomes the basis of hope. The story of our past becomes the basis of hope and meaning. And I love the way Viktor Frankl kind of affirms this when he writes, uh, and he's famous for saying this, that having been, having been is the surest kind of being. This appealing idea becomes more meaningful when the future seems short, limited, unstable or opaque. The living that we have done comes into sharper focus as the basis for meaning. And so the listening space of the spiritual care practitioner with the ageing person often focuses on life that has been lived and its meaning for the way we choose to live now and into the future, given the set of limited and changing circumstances within which we exist. So you may be asking, yes, but isn't narrative story a kind of limited thing for those with a really healthy prefrontal cortex and a good solid understanding of the power of story and the meaning of story for us? What if my cognitive memory is confused by dementia? Good spiritual care recognises that the desire for meaning and relationship are not only situated in the parts of the brain that engage in cognitive reflection on future and past. Memory and desire are deeply intrinsic to all of our bodily systems that work together to pursue the conditions under which life is possible. Memory, and what Albert Schweitzer says or calls the will to live, are in our brains, our cardiovascular systems, our muscular skeletal systems, our neurosystems, even in our skin. You name it, every part of your organism is infused with the will to live meaningful life in relationship with others and with the environment, the world around you. It is little wonder that people living with dementia 
and with Alzheimer's disease and various other forms of cognitive limitation. Who have varying limitations in their ability, ability to remember, do respond and can respond to music, for example. Movement, words and deep listening presence and they respond in ways that often reveal the depth of the search for meaning and relationship in them. It is for this reason that I would challenge McKinley's assertion that spirituality is not about the physical or psychological dimensions. We cannot separate spirituality out from the organic whole. Meaning and relationship are part of the very fibre of our being and play a significant part in our capacity to stay alive and indeed to have evolved to be who we are in the first place. All of these things about us as human beings, about our nature as beings of meaning and relationship, as spiritual beings, contribute to the meaning of spiritual care. So I'm going to suggest that spiritual care is about listening presence. It's not merely about being present with or being present to a person while they suffer or while they question or quest or desire. It is actually about creating a space with them that is conducive for them in the task of finding their own spiritual resources in order to live life fully in their circumstances. This creation of space requires a particular kind of listening. It requires you and I, as people aspiring to be spiritual carers, to be present and yet not so present that we fill the space. We are present in order to create, establish and invite a space that we hold entirely for the other person in which they do their own spiritual work. We listen with them, to them. We also listen to ourselves and our responses to them in order to create a space that enables them to do the work that they need to do in terms of finding meaning and relationship in their circumstances. I'm going to use the word kenosis. It's a, a Greek word that means self-emptying. But there are a couple of ways in the Christian Bible and also the Hebrew Scriptures that this idea of self-emptying is used to give us a sense of what it means to be listening in the way of a spiritual care practitioner. First of all, the very act of creation that the God of the Hebrew Bible uh, does uh, is a kenotic act. For when God creates other things and other beings, God necessarily moves over to create space for the other to be. That is the sense of kenosis that I'm talking about. And the other famous um, example comes from Philippians chapter 2, the great hymn, where the word kenosis is actually used. Uh, used in a Christological sense, in the sense of Jesus, the Christ, uh, self-emptying in order not to be filling the space in the sense of being established in himself as a God, but actually empties himself in order to become fully human and to invite us to become fully human. And the word there, this word for self-emptying is kenosis. So spiritual care is kenotic. It is not about the practitioner achieving a therapeutic end for the person in their care. It is about the canotic spirit of creating and holding a space into which the other may come in all of their organic living and existence to listen deeply to themselves and to be listened to in order that they may discover their own spiritual resources for living. So spiritual care is creating a safe space with canotic humility within which common humanity is established and the encounter invites the care recipient to discover and to rediscover their own spiritual resources 
through which they are able to approach the possibility of expanding meaning and relationship in any given circumstance. The Pachowski definition also mentions relationship to what it calls the sacred or the significant. Sacredness has obvious associations with religion and religion is, is very often a profoundly meaningful language for the expression and practice of people's spirituality. Yet sacredness is not confined to religious symbols, places or communities. Sacred is a synonym for holy. But the problem with these words, sacred and holy, for us today, is that they have become too closely associated with moral goodness. In fact, their meaning is far more deeply spiritual and connected to the complexity of actual living than that. Rudolf Otto, who wrote one of my favourite books called The Idea of the Holy, it's a very old book and you can see this one has been well used and perhaps not quite so loved as what it should have been. The idea of the holy. He began using a different word. The word numinous instead of holy or sacred. In order to rescue the idea of holiness or sacredness uh, from the clutches of narrow <clears throat> religious morality. Numinous literally means the spiritual power in a thing. It captures the sense of otherness in things that actually exist. The sense of otherness, this sense of otherness, has been described, I think, more accurately by philosopher Raymond Gator as that which is irreducible. In his discussions about human beings, for example, he suggests that you can define what it you that you sorry, that you can't define what it means to be human by using criteria like, well, uh, you're human if you're useful to society or you're human if you possess all of these virtues. If you did try to do this, the people living in the institution that Gator worked in as a young man would be excluded from the definition of human being. He says, you cannot reduce what it means to be human to any of these criteria or any other criteria. Humanity, what it means to be human, is irreducible. It is mysterious. It is sacred or holy. <clears throat> Spiritual care always establishes the humanity of the other person and never does so on the basis of any religious, cultural or sociological criteria. The human person in all its conditions, is irreducible and therefore intrinsically precious. And therefore, to be human means to seek a relationship or a connection with all that is irreducible, all that is mysterious, all that is sacred in actual existence. It is a core part of what it means to live a meaningful and related life. You can see, I hope, just how profoundly important spiritual care could be to many people of advanced age because of the kinds of changes that are occurring in their lives. Loss and its accompanying grief in so many forms. Changing physical abilities. Changing cognitive abilities. Changing relationships within families, isolation, loss of self-determination, and the list goes on. And I challenge you to make a good long list of all of the kinds of changes that are occurring uh, in the ageing process. And so spiritual care can be, and often is, of profound importance to people of advanced age. But spiritual care is not about helping people to escape from the reality of their humanness. It is not about reassuring them that the changes that are taking place in their lives, that the imminence of suffering and death is not real. It's not about imagining a better place. Such utopian appeals to our childish desire to pretend that what is happening to us isn't really happening is pathological. 
Religion that attempts this is called by Anglican spiritual director Kenneth Leach, pathological religion. Such attempts are pathological because they try to make us forget that we are human beings. Spiritual care never does this. It invites us to learn what it is about, what it is about being human that is full of meaning and relationship. It is these elements of our being that enables us to live that enable us to live fully even as we are dying. So I challenge you as you read to explore the themes. There are much broader themes than what I've covered here in this little reflection today. Explore the themes of what spiritual care might mean in the context of advancing age. Now, you may be a counsellor, you may be a spiritual care practitioner in a public health institution or a prison or a school. Whatever the context you are or will be working in, I challenge you to consider just what spiritual care really is and how you, as a professional person, might be able to either include it in your practice of what you do or apply yourself to a professional role as a spiritual care practitioner in an organisation and thus contribute to the collective human conversation of what it means to be human, what it means to live fully with meaning and relationship and contribute to the ongoing life of the world and of our human communities. Go well.